Guide in the Exercise of Mental Prayer for the Man of Good Will by the Very Reverend Joseph Simler, originally published by the Society of Mary in 1887, and it's available from blessedsacramentbooks.com. Chapter 16. How and Why the Examination of Mental Prayer is Made Souls that take their progress in mental prayer to heart do not fail to make regularly their daily examination of this exercise. This examination is, in some way, an integral part of mental prayer, as the proof of a scientific solution is a part of the operation, if one wishes to be sure whether it is correct or faulty. It may be affirmed that it is impossible to make the daily examination of mental prayer without becoming men of mental prayer, nay, it is the shortest way to arriving at this end. It is necessary to fix a time for this examination, for example, several minutes of the time devoted to the particular examination. As mental prayer is made under the protection of the guardian angel, it is advisable to beg our guardian angel to assist us in this complementary work. The examination comprises all the parts of mental prayer, the ensemble and the details, but for one day or for one week, lay special stress on such acts, or on this point, then on another. Never omit to question yourself on the various preparations, and in order to guide you in the discovery of your faults, peruse what we have already said on this point. Observe the same for the considerations, affections, and resolutions. Never fail to examine yourself on the special or principal resolution. Nothing is more useful than to direct your attention to the ordinary defect of your mental prayer, as well as to the special defect of your last meditation, so that you may avoid it next time. We recommend the infliction of penance for the ensemble of the faults ascertained, and for every fault grievous in itself, in its consequences or circumstances. One profitable penance would consist in resuming every meditation in which there has been too much negligence. For this, we should choose the first leisure moments. Experience proves that this remedy is very efficacious, although the new meditation were to last but five minutes. Another excellent means to aid us in making our meditation well is to keep an account of it in writing, with a personal estimate of the exercise. This account should be short. Not to make it brief would be exposing ourselves often to forget it, and soon to neglect it altogether. It will be a great assurance to you that you will persevere in this practice if you submit your account to your director. It is likewise advantageous to enter into a memorandum book immediately after meditation. The thoughts, sentiments, and resolutions which have made an impression on you by putting them in writing, we come to understand and retain them better. In afterlife, these notes are perused with great profit and even with pleasure. The soul experiences that which we feel when meeting again with old acquaintances. We here give a summary of the most ordinary questions in the examination of mental prayer. Each one will modify the questions according as it concerns the daily or monthly examination. In the monthly examination, we endeavor to know our habitual dispositions rather than our faults. In this, it differs from the daily examination. To arrive at a satisfactory result, it is not necessary to examine ourselves thoroughly on each of these questions, if time does not allow. It suffices to dwell more seriously, sometimes on one, sometimes on another of these points. The essential thing is to make a brief examination each day and a complete one each month. Here follows the points on which it is useful to question ourselves. 1. Have I advanced or retrograded in what concerns the remote preparation, control over myself and my passions, struggle against sin, against every irregular allurement, dissipation, carelessness, pride, sensuality, silence, recollection, vigilance, remembrance of the presence of God, practice of ejaculatory prayers, 
and esteem for mental prayer? 2. How do I perform the proximate preparation? Choice of subject and fruit to be derived therefrom, exactness, and respectful bearing. 3. How do I habitually make the various acts of the immediate preparation, invocation of the Holy Ghost, representation of the subject, recommendation to the guardian angel, recourse to the Most Holy Virgin, to St. Joseph, and to my holy patrons, acts of faith in the presence of God, and other complementary acts of faith? 4. Have I endeavored to make the prayer of faith by repeated acts of faith in the presence and word of God, by interrogating and listening to faith, i.e. to God, to his doctrine, to his gospel, to his church, to his saints, to my rules, in order to conform my thoughts, judgments, words, and actions to them. 5. Have I applied myself to the prayer of meditation or considerations by endeavoring to penetrate myself with the lessons conveyed by the truth, or the fact on which I am meditating? Have these considerations produced a salutary impression on my soul? 6. Have I applied myself to the prayer of supplication or affections, especially to the invocations suggested by the meditation on the subject or by the needs of my soul? 7. Have I applied myself to the prayer of union of conformity to the will of God, by taking resolutions calculated to conduct my soul to such dispositions and to strengthen her therein? Have I taken an efficacious resolution to gain a decisive victory over a special fault, or to advance in a particular virtue? Have I renewed it in every meditation until success was complete? or at least satisfactory. How far am I in this work? Why have I not kept my resolutions? What must I do to remove the cause of these faults? 8. Which is the saddest effect of my last meditation, and which are the principal or the ordinary difficulties during my meditations? What is the cause thereof, and what have I to do to remove this cause forever? Do I, during meditation, endeavor to awaken in myself and keep up sentiments of humility and confidence in preference to all other sentiments? Impressed with these sentiments, do I apply myself to increase the acts of humility and the invocations whenever I am reduced to powerlessness or have difficulties to encounter? 10. How do I habitually make the acts of the conclusion and how do I spend the first moments after mental prayer? 11. Am I convinced that the time of mental prayer is the time most usefully employed, even for succeeding in the functions of my charge and for promoting the true interests of the works and of the persons entrusted to my responsibility? 12. I must at any cost become a man of meditation. Am I well convinced that such is the will of God in my regard? Do I really believe that meditation is an easy exercise, not beyond my capacity, that I can and ought to succeed in it? To what must I, in consequence, apply myself during the coming month, or in my next meditation? 13. How is it that, after so many months and years, I'm still so far from being a man of meditation? Why am I so easily induced to perform mental prayer with negligence, to lose so many and such precious moments during this holy exercise, and to languish thus, perhaps, until death? And 14. Against what defect or towards what point must I direct my principal efforts? What does God require of me that I may become, with His grace, a man of prayer? Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God.